Online with Richard Sandoval is a production of Hispanic Lifestyle, which is sponsored by Goya Foods. Goya Foods, America's largest Hispanic-owned food company, distributes over 2,500 high-quality food products ideal for every taste and every table. For a listing of Goya Foods products and great recipes, log on to Goya.com. You know we're living in different times when Edward James Olmos is in my living room on my screen. Sir, more importantly, how are you and how is your family doing during this uh, rough time? Uh, It's been quite emotional. Um, Mainly, we're doing great. Everyone's getting through it and all my children and my grandchildren. But uh, just last week, uh, a week ago, um, Tuesday, we're on Friday now, a week ago Tuesday, um, my sister, uh, my younger sister, she's in her 50s and she's a nurse. Oh, and uh, her and my other sister is a nurse. My mother was a nurse. They were all nurses and uh, they've been helping. My mother was the first one into the AIDS ward here in the County General Hospital in Los Angeles in 1987. When they opened it, nobody wanted to go in. She was the first one that actually walked through the door and went into the AIDS ward where the AIDS patients were. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew how you got it. It was really quite courageous, but you know, she, she that's the kind of person that she is. And of course she made from, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. My sisters are pretty, pretty uh, heroic in their own world. And of course, one of my sisters got, got the virus and uh, goodness, she's very fortunate in that, uh, you know, she got it. Um, she was diagnosed with as a negative on Friday, and then on Sunday she started to feel bad. And on Monday she felt real bad. And on Tuesday she walked into the to the uh, hospital at uh, Kaiser Downey, and uh, from there she ended up uh, uh, getting treatment. And I was very grateful that uh, we were able to get some very good treatment. And uh, she had to go in to get intubated. And uh, in the in the in, uh, uh, intensive care unit, ICU, and uh, that became really difficult. And I knew what was going to happen because you know when you get intubated, it's really difficult for your body and your the way that they have to what they have to do to you, so that uh, you know eighty percent of the people that get intubated don't come out well. So um, I was really scared and and. Uh, I called a friend of mine who helped me get in touch with the hospital and uh, I asked them if they would use oxygen and uh, they uh, they did. They used pure 100% oxygen instead of intubating and they put it right into her lungs and uh, for eight hours, 100%. And she said it was kind of tough, you know, but uh, they used that and they used the new drug that uh, is proving itself to be quite successful too. And um, so together, uh, the following day, there was, this was Wednesday when she was put into ICU. She was taken out of ICU and put into another private room to, to use the air, oxygen because they don't use that therapy. And this is the first time they, they ever used oxygenation therapy on a, on a patient. So they had no idea what was going to happen. But they did it, and it worked. And it, uh, she got it on Thursday. She said she could breathe again. She was feeling so good. And then on Friday, she really felt good, and she was very thankful and grateful. We wept, we cried together, and because uh, it worked. And then uh, on Saturday, um, they kept her in there to check her out. And then on Monday, they let her go home. So that was just last Monday, and so she'd been home, and uh, she's resting. And the first thing out of her mouth when she was, I got to find out when I can go back to work. I said, please, man, let your lungs kind of repair themselves before you go into the battlefield again without any of the right equipment that you need. That's why you got sick. That's why everybody's kind of getting sick. They just don't have the right equipment to be fighting this disease. And so that being said, um, here we are. And so you asked me how I felt while right. we're going on. Here we are. We're <laughs> facing the reality of knowing that uh, I've been in quarantine now for six weeks by myself in my home. And uh, my grandchildren and my children, they talk to me through Skype or FaceTime or whatever. 
And then, um, you know, I've been doing well and uh, taking care of business. I mean, we've been really, really doing some great work in this in the last couple of uh, months. And I'm very grateful that uh, you're asking me to come on your show and do this. I've always enjoyed uh, the time that you take with media on the red carpet or whatever event we're at, whether it was the Book and Family Festival. You've always been so generous with your time. So uh, again, I appreciate that. And, but how you came across my desk is I, I get press releases and we're talking about the Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival. And I, I, I know it's grown, but I'm, I, I'm saying this tongue in cheek. Are people going to go to a movie theater right now and sit next to each other? Or do you guys have something new planned for two Well, we have La Leaf uh, Connect, it's called. <laughs> and it's new and it's an online initiative which addresses the problems that we're facing right now with unable to go to the theater without leaving our home. So now for free, right now, as of April 14th, the first, first uh, situation initiative took hold because it comes in two parts. The first part was from April uh, 14th, which started a couple of days ago. And it's showing uh, the retrospective of 2019, showing the uh, films, the documentaries, the uh, uh, animation films, the artwork, the, uh, all of the uh, musical talent that, that helped. So you could actually watch the, the whole, uh, uh, the whole uh, festival from uh, last year. 2019 and then on that goes up to May 4th then on May 5th starts the really incredible part which is um, 2020 so that's May 5th throughout the entire month we'll be showing all of this, the work that we would have been showing in uh, throughout this year and uh, and so people get to see it and guess what everybody it's free just go to www.latinofilm.org that simple and you'll see latino connect and you'll see some of the you know the best films done by latinos in uh, the united states and around the world and, and there's animation there's music there's uh, art there's uh, uh you know documentaries uh, and just you know if you have a little bit of time and you're tired of watching netflix and uh, you know the normal situations that you can find this is completely unique this is stuff you'll never get to see unless you go see it here. That's what the great thing about La Leaf has been from the beginning. The Lati Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival has been able to bring about an understanding of artistic endeavors that would never be seen in the United States of America. And if so, they'd be seen maybe at film festivals, Latino film festivals that are scattered throughout the United States. But basically we bring uh, world premieres and, and uh, regional premieres uh, of presentation, artistic work that we would never be able to see. They're not going to put them in the theaters. And uh, man, they're really good. They're really different. And I think that, you know, people will really appreciate it this year. You know, uh, we have uh, some great, great short films. We have some great documentaries. We have some streamline on musicals. We have so much to offer. And, and we have music, and a music component that is really great that uh, you can go online at www.latinofilm.org and you can actually get a, a rundown of everything. I'm not going to try to bombard you with all no, the and, and I promise I will put up a, uh, <laughs> a graphic on, on the screen. You know, um, I, I want to get back into it, but one of, one of the things I really felt about the internet and then transition to the time we are right now is mm -hmm. the internet is really it, it, it gives a level playing field, if you will, the access to not only information, but the arts. And I know that you've been a huge advocate of that. And so being able to transition, if you will, uh, to holding this event online, I mean, that's just taking it the step further. Yeah, I think that this is one of the great things that has come about. And, and obviously, I think we're going to continue to do this throughout the lifetime of the film festival in, in ways that will make people enjoy at the theater because there's nothing like going to theater and seeing it on the big screen. And it'll also and live performances and uh, of the documentaries and the live performances of the music. But also it just gives you a sense of those people who are not in Los Angeles. You know, now they can see right. it. They're anywhere in the world can jump on it and see it. And it becomes really beautiful. And uh, 
not everybody has computers. Not everyone has uh, the ability to jump on online, but it's another method in the process of communication that is so vital right now. I, I'm very grateful that we have it. Again, I feel as though, I know we're here in Southern California, and the fact is that, uh, that we have a significant Latino population here, but we're talking about people in Chicago, people in the Midwest, of course, people in Texas. I mean, there are creatives throughout the United States. Um, mm -hmm. Not to put you on the spot, is there one or two of your favorites that you're looking forward to uh, tuning into, logging into? I don't even really know what the proper in, in, words is. Uh, in respects of, uh, for the film festival this year? Yes, yes. Oh, the God. Film I, I have to go. I got to tell you, I, I watch, uh, you know, um, a lot of the short films, uh, Say You Will and uh, Baby Flowers Within, Maria, Riso, short films that are just real poignant, really done by a lot of the women directors and filmmakers in our country, Latinas. And uh, we have the, the, the actual uh, May 5th, it starts off with The Last Rafter, which is a really poignant little story it's a long, long, long form uh, film. It's a, it's a real film, uh, fictional film and d dramatic film. And uh, it deals with a Cuban boy who comes across on a raft to Miami from Cuba okay. to look for his father. And uh, what happens? He's the first one that is under the new law that says they can't do that anymore. You can't come across anymore. So he's actually uh, <laughs> an illegal alien coming in from Cuba. And that's, this, you know, before they used to accept them with open arms. Right. And now, now that stopped. So this is the last rafter. And uh, it's a very oh. poignant, very poignant film. That's on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. I, I highly recommend that you should watch it. It's, it's one, of, again, it's a story and a voice that you would never hear in any film done in the United States of America or from around the world. These are artistic endeavors of the highest level and young, good, good uh, directors. Uh, Oscar uh, Ortega and Carlos Betancourt are the two directors who uh, directed The Last Rafter. And it's going to be, uh, it's critically acclaimed. It's a tremendously beautiful film. And I think that uh, people will enjoy it. And uh, I highly recommend it. Is it me? Is it seem like our Latina directors are more visible? I, 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 I don't know. They're doing a darn good job of getting their information out and being organized. I was just curious if uh, you felt and you mentioned it. I, are you experiencing the same thing? Oh, yeah. Big time. Um, Latino filmmakers, period. And uh, we come in all cultures because uh, Latinos are all cultures, true. African, they're Asian, they're Caucasian, they're mezclados mixtures, they're you know, indigenous. They're, they're truly a gift of all the cultures put together, as we know. But I got to tell you, going, I'll give you an example. We do the Youth Cinema Project, which is on every, uh, on Wednesdays and Fridays at one o'clock Pacific Coast time. You can watch uh, films being made by the uh, California students that are in our youth cinema project and what they we've been able to do is teach children how to use the format of, of creating film from the story uh, synopsis treatment to production to post-production to marketing to setting up your own LLC and all this is done from the fourth grade onward and it's a very impactful uh, uh, program that is spreading very quickly. It's all over the California right now. There's over 1,400 kids that get it. And they get it twice a week for 90 minutes. What happens, we send in two mentors, uh, film uh, masters, uh, who uh, come in to teach the class with the teacher. So there's three people in the room teaching. But the two uh, filmmakers take on the responsibility of the, the 90 minutes of the, of the teaching process for the films. And what has happened is, is the self-esteem, self-respect, and self-worth of the students that are taking it, starting in the fourth grade, uh, going all the way up through high school, and then it's, it's a, a pipeline into college now. And uh, 
but what has happened over the, we started in 98, but it's exploded in the last seven years. And the Youth Cinema Project, what has happened is that it gives an opportunity for people to have critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication given to them at a very young age. And it gives them an empowerment of the reasoning for learning. They become lifelong learners from this program. Uh, uh, Stanford University came in and did uh, an assessment of the, uh, the program over a year period and said that this was a remarkable program. And of course now Arizona wants it, Texas wants it, uh, Georgia wants it, uh, Florida wants it, New York wants it, uh, they want it in Canada, it's already in Panama, uh, out of the country even. And uh, it's very, very, very powerful means of, of inspiring children. Now, the reason I said this, you asked me about women filmmakers. Right. <laughs> well, we have more women being the directors, the producers, and the writers than we do young men. The men go for cinematography, and there's a lot of women that do cinematography too. They go in for, you know, uh, sound. They go into uh, different aspects, but the real thrust is in young women. The fourth graders, especially the young women of 10 years old, they, they most, many of them are very quiet, very shy, because coming out of third grade, going into the fourth grade, for all of those that are listening to me and understand it, that was a very difficult transitional period. First and second grade, everybody was kind of equal. Third grade, you started to read in a contemporary way that became a little more difficult. And if you weren't up to the reading level of a third grader and read up to third grade when you go on to the fourth grade, you're behind and you're really scared of the fourth grade. You get real fear and you can become very quiet, you become non-participant, and that's what has happened to a lot of our students. And so with this program, it's like they come out, whoa, because all of a sudden they're not reading from a book, they're not, they're learning creativity, they're learning critical thinking, they're learning how to collaborate with the different uh, students in the room, they're learning how to, uh, to, to uh, uh, really become part of a collective in, in working on a project and working forward. Now, it's been an amazing experience for them, and this is where the girls have really pushed forward. You get kids that have never spoken a word in the classroom, and the teachers, even in the third grade, they were very, very shy. In the fourth grade, they get into this, and all of a sudden, they, they want to be the director, because we teach them, you know, directing, we teach them producing, we teach them sound, we teach them film, we teach them camera, we teach them uh, gaffing, we teach them lighting, we teach them... Uh, a makeup, we teach them uh, all of the entire perspective because we're there for the full year. This is not just a uh, afternoon special, you know, for three weeks or eight weeks. Right. Study. This is like the whole school year. From the beginning of the very first week, we're in there and and twice a week, man, for 90 minutes, we change the, the whole perspective of the room. And it's so good for them. If you go on to Youth Cinema Project, you'll on uh, YouTube, you'll see what the work that we're doing there that is just amazing. And so, again, women have really started to find their voice inside of this art form in a way that is prolific and profound. And I'm very grateful that they're doing it. And I'm grateful that we exposed them to it. And I got to tell you, what we're doing right now is developing not just the next filmmakers, but we're developing the next real um, learners, you know, people who really want to learn and really want to move forward. This is something both you and I have known for years. The bottom line is the women in our households, whether they're the mothers or our wives, <laughs> direct us like nobody can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, Chancla always comes out with grandma. <laughs> no, that, that always came out, man. She would say, what did you say? <laughs> Come over here, my son. Andale, tu andale. And this see, was see, to the back. I don't know about you. The, the most embarrassing part is when my mother threw the shoe at me and then made me <laughs> go pick it up and bring it back to her. <laughs> Those are the good um, old days. Uh, yeah. Yep. I miss mom, that's for sure. Yeah, we do. Um, 